How heartbreak fueled Fleetwood Mac's rumours and Silver Springs with affairs, feuds and breakups. Stevie Nicks is on the road with Lindsay Buckingham when they drive past a sign that inspires her to write what she considers her best song, Silver Springs. Stevie later said of the song, I wrote Silver Springs about Lindsay. We were in Maryland somewhere driving under a freeway sign that said Silver Spring, Maryland. And I loved the name. Silver Springs sounded like a pretty fabulous place to me. And you could be my Silver Springs, that's just a whole symbolic thing of what you could have been to me. As we get into the breakdown of Fleetwood Mac's relationships, it raises the question, can couples work together and have a healthy relationship? And is great art rooted in suffering? Fleetwood Mac share insights into the demise of their relationships that created rumours, and if that album would be the same without the troubles that you are about to hear about. Years earlier, Lindsay and Stevie are attending Menlo Atherton High School in Northern California, when Stevie spots Lindsay playing the song California Dreamin', and then brazenly burst into harmony with him. Though there is certainly a spark between the two, they go their separate ways and do not reunite until two years later when Buckingham is searching for a new female vocalist for his band. Now both at San Jose University, they are somewhat more mature and certainly more ready to push on to pursue their musical careers. In the early 1970s, the band was going nowhere, prompting Lindsay and Stevie to leave for Los Angeles. Suddenly, they were together in every sense of the word. I'm not sure we would have even become a couple, if it wasn't for us leaving that band. It kind of pushed us together, Stevie would later say, according to biography, Gold Dust Woman. Under the name Buckingham Nicks, the duo released their self-titled album in 1973 with a folk rock sound, with two appearing topless on the cover. It flopped on arrival, resulting in the label dropping them. Lindsay went to work as a session guitarist for Don Everly, while Stevie waited tables. I loved being a waitress. I did lunches, she told Mass Live. I came home with good money. It was enough to pay our rent, and it was enough to pay for our food, and it was enough to pay for our Toyota that had no reverse. It was fun, and I made really great money, and I had no problem being the breadwinner because really, what was Lindsay Buckingham going to do? Be a waiter? I don't think so. He tried telemarketing for one day, and the first person who hung up on him that was it. He quit. We came through it with a great laugh. For the next couple of years, they continued to work, writing songs and struggling to pursue their music dreams. Nick spoke kindly of their relationship. I loved him before he was a millionaire. We were two kids out of Menlo Atherton High School. I loved him for all the right reasons, she said. We did have a great relationship at first. I loved taking care of him and the house. Then, in December 1974, Mick Fleetwood visits Sound City Studios in Los Angeles. After Keith Olsen, a recording engineer, played Fleetwood Frozen Love by the duo Buckingham Nicks, he was captivated by their talent. Fleetwood Mac originally formed in England in 1967 and went through several different lineups and a legal dispute with their then manager by this point. While at the studio, Fleetwood met Lindsay Buckingham and asked if he would join the band. Buckingham agreed on one condition. If his girlfriend Stevie Nicks could join too, they officially became a part of Fleetwood Mac on New Year's Eve 1974. Stevie reflected on her initial thoughts of their playing with Fleetwood Mac to Billboard. I said, I think we can do something for this band. We'll do it for a year, save some money, and if we don't like it, we'll quit. But soon the band begins to gel and they form a friendship and develop an incredible sound. Stevie describes the scene with the band and her situation with Lindsay, who she had been fighting with. I got an apartment on Hollywood Boulevard, he moved back in with me, and we kind of put our relationship back together. We weren't fighting about money, we had a really nice place, and we were going to work with these hysterically funny English people every day, making great music. In July 1975, Fleetwood Mac released their self-titled album. It sold over half a million copies within the year, and it featured two major hits written by Nix, Landslide and Rhiannon. They begin to tour to promote the album, and soon their hard work pays off. The album went on to peak at number one in the US, 15 months after its release. The sudden fame and gruelling schedule soon begins to affect the band and their relationships. They begin writing and working on the follow-up album, Rumours. In February 1976, Fleetwood Mac convened at the record plant in Sausalito, California to begin recording. The setup included a number of small recording rooms in a large windowless wooden building. Most band members complained about the studio and wanted to record at their homes, but Fleetwood did not allow any moves. That house was like the riot house, Nick's told Uncut. There were girls everywhere and everybody was completely drunk the whole time. Me and Chris decided we couldn't be there, the next day we moved out and got two matching apartments next to each other. She continued, We didn't have anybody else. 
The band gave me a friend in this woman, and I could hang out with Christine. Fleetwood Mac had plenty of material to work with, as Christine and John McVie, the band's vocalist and bass guitarist, decide to call it quits. The McVees only spoke to each other to discuss music during this period. Christine's despair from her eight-year marriage ending led her to writing one of the band's most successful songs, Don't Stop, in order to pull herself out of heartbreak. Biography described the song as an ode to looking ahead in life. To add fuel to the fire, Christine begins dating Fleetwood Mac's lighting director. This just adds to the tension with the couple during recording. The song You Make Loving Fun was also an homage to finding new love following the ending of her marriage. While John and Christine are doing their best to maintain their professionalism, not discussing outside of the music how they are internally coping with the breakup, Lindsay and Stevie are also experiencing trouble in paradise. They begin having intense arguments and screaming matches with one another at home and in the studio. During the recording of You Make Loving Fun, producer Ken Callett remembers that, during the session, Nix and Buckingham were involved in a heated yelling match, shouting curses and insults at each other. However, when it came time to sing, they immediately turned it off and pretended like everything was normal. I remember when we were doing background vocals, Stevie and Lindsay were having an argument, Kylette said. Vicious name-calling. You mother effing this, you effing bastard that. Back and forth it went. The tape would start rolling and they'd sing, You make loving fun, just beautiful, two little angels. The tape would stop and they'd be calling each other names again. They didn't miss a beat. A lot of Lindsay's lyrics sparked fights with Stevie, Kylat explained. I didn't know exactly what was happening at the time, but words were flying around, particularly Lindsay's, about their breakup. Stevie hated when Lindsay got even a little literal. The minute Lindsay would start singing his lyrics, and Stevie stormed out and the session would end. Nix took particular umbrage with Buckingham's Go Your Own Way, in which he sings I very, very much resented him telling the world that packing up, shacking up with different men was all I wanted to do, Nix told Rolling Stone in 1997. He knew it wasn't true. It was just an angry thing that he said. Every time those words would come out, I wanted to go over and kill him. He knew it, so he really pushed my buttons through that. In addition to romantic disputes in the band, bassist John McVie clashed with Buckingham over creative decisions made in the studio, particularly over some of the album's bass parts. McVie reminds Buckingham that the band you're in is Fleetwood Mac, I'm the Mac, and I play the bass. Buckingham told Billboard that Christine was more receptive to his creative input. As the studio sessions progressed, the band members' new intimate relationships that formed after various separations started to have a negative effect. They reportedly become self-indulgent with sleepless nights, and the extensive use of cocaine marked much of the album's production. Chris Stone, one of the record plant's owners, indicated in 1997 that Fleetwood Mac brought excess at its most excessive. He said the band would come in at seven at night, have a big feast, party till one or two in the morning, and then when they were so whacked out they couldn't do anything, they'd start recording. On the song Gold Dust Woman, Stevie Nicks confirmed that gold dust was a metaphor for cocaine. Everybody was doing a little bit, you know, we never bought it or anything, it was just around. And I really imagined that it could overtake everything, never thinking a million years that it would overtake me. I must have met a couple of people that I thought did too much, and I must have been impressed by that, because I made it into a whole story. Stevie explains that her relationship finally ended after many fights with Buckingham, while recording rumours, Lindsay and I had a really bad argument. I was just about to go back to LA, Nix has been quoted as saying, and I said, we're done, I think it's over. I don't think all the king's horses and all the king's men can undo it. Recording rumours became a theatrical affair, with the exes addressing one another's faults and their own pain. Silver Springs was Nix's tribute to the fairy tale ending with Lindsay Buckingham. The title came from Silver Spring, Maryland. While passing through the town on tour, Nix romanticised the name. It sounded like a pretty fabulous place to me, she said in classic albums about rumours. It's a whole symbolic thing of what Lindsay could have been to me. Stevie was excited about the track and felt that it would be one of the best on the album. She even has plans to gift the publishing rights to her mother. The song Second Hand News is written by Lindsay Buckingham. The track includes the lyrics, One thing I think you should know, I ain't gonna miss you when you go, is inspired by Buckingham's bitter fights and breakups 
with Stevie Nicks during this time. Stevie explains the difficult feelings. We were all trying to break up and when you break up with someone, you don't want to see him. You especially don't want to eat breakfast with him the next morning, see him all day and all night, and all day the day after. Nix composes dreams thanks to funk musician Sly Stone's bed, no less. She said in an interview, Everybody was working on something else in the main studio, and I had this idea. I was kind of wandering around the studio looking for somewhere I could curl up with my Fender Rhodes and my lyrics and a little cassette tape recorder. Then she came across a friendly guy who seemed to understand and asked if she was looking for a place to go and play. He said he knew a place. As Nix recalled him saying, you can never tell anybody, to which Nix's response was, a magic room, oh my god, I'll never tell anybody. The room in question was that of the esteemed Slystone, which happened to be a mini studio. Nix described the room, it's a big studio with a sunken circular shape, actually like a lighthouse, like a circle, and there's keyboards all around, a bunch of keyboards that went down this tunnel kind of thing. The part of the room that would become the hub of Nix's brainstorming session, the bed that occupied a part of the room. She continues, this big half moon circular bed with all black and red velvet. It sounds a little garish, but it was actually beautiful. Nix took her place on the bed and just started playing dreams. And within about 20 minutes, it was written. I mean, super simply, but I thought, thank you, Sly Stone. Just like that, in a matter of less than half an hour, dreams was written and composed. So then I wrote dreams. And because I'm the chiffony chick who believes in fairies and angels, and Lindsay is a hardcore guy, it comes out differently. Lindsay is saying, go ahead and date other men and go live your crappy life, and I'm singing about the rain washing you clean. We were coming at it from opposite angles, but we were really saying the same exact thing. She continued the thought in The New Yorker in 2022. It's really about our breakup. He's looking at it from a very unpleasant, angry way, and I'm saying, in my more airy-fairy way, we're going to be all right. We'll get through this. Dreams became the manifestation of how the feuds and turmoil the band is dealing with result in their ability to channel their agony into pitch-perfect harmony, which will prove a winning formula. Never Going Back Again is a song written by Buckingham. He later recalls it being one of the last songs written for the album after he had started a rebound relationship with another woman after his breakup with Stevie. Buckingham regards it as a sweet and naive song and does not consider the lyrics to be very deep. The song reflects a desire not to repeat previous mistakes. Christine recalls writing Songbird. I woke up in the middle of the night and the song just came into my head. I got out of bed, played it on the little piano I have in my room and sang it with no tape recorder. I sang it from beginning to end. Everything. She added, I can't tell you quite how I felt. It was as if I'd been visited. It was a very spiritual thing. I was frightened to play it again in case I'd forgotten it. The next morning, McVie took it to producer Ken Calliott and put it down on a two-track recorder. I don't know where that song came from. I wished it would happen more often, but it hasn't. The ambiguity of Songbird captures the selflessness of love for someone or oneself. McVie insisted that the song was never about anyone or anything in particular. Oh Daddy was a song Christine wrote and the inspiration behind the song she explains. Mix the Big Daddy for sure, and we always call him Big Daddy. I was being a little sarcastic on the chorus. You know, how can you think you're always so right? And I could never get the last line. Stevie gave me the last line, and I can't walk away from you if I tried, and I just knew I was going to say it. Still, Christine acknowledged to Rolling Stone in 1997, everybody was pretty weirded out. Somehow Mick was there, the figurehead. We must carry on. Let's be mature about this, sort it out. Somehow we waded through it. The Chain is one of the most iconic Fleetwood Mac songs and one that is central to their 1977 masterpiece. Creating The Chain involved fitting together the contributions of each member in a way that resulted in a coherent song which was no easy task. Despite being the first song they started working on for Rumours, it was near the end of the nine-month recording session when they were finally able to tie it together, thanks to the famous bass line that McVie came up with on the spot. While each member may have contributed their own part to the song's arrangement, the lyrics were purely a Stevie Nicks creation, Mick Fleetwood said. Lyrically, the chain centers itself around the invisible chain that holds two people, or a group of people together. The looming reality 
is that the relationship has run its course and it's time to sever that bond, but memories and emotions hold it together. The song opens with an eerie intro that creeps up into the first verse, sung by Buckingham and Nix. The album was nearly finished when Mick pulled Stevie out into the parking lot of the record plant studio in Sausalito. Mick tells Stevie that Silver Springs will not make the album. It was too long. Stevie describes her panic upon hearing this. Well, their reasons are it was too long, and so, without asking me or telling me, they recorded I Don't Want to Know and put Silver Springs on the back of Go Your Own Way, which was probably one of the most devastating things anybody has ever done to me in my life. And I remember vividly running out into the middle of the record plant studio parking lot and screaming because I knew that Silver Springs deserved to be on that record, and that I Don't Want to Know was really just a really fun guitar song. Silver Springs was all about me and Lindsay, you know. He didn't write beautiful love songs about me, but I did write some beautiful love songs about him. Stevie Nicks wrote I Don't Want to Know much earlier than the Rumours sessions. Lindsay sings lead, as he knows the song from their previous recording days when they were playing together as a duo. The other band members of Fleetwood Mac decided to use the song as a replacement. I never thought that Silver Springs would ever be performed on stage or would ever be heard of again. My beautiful song just disappeared, she told MTV in 1997. Then two decades later, the dance revived the song and earned the group another Grammy. For it to come back around like this has really been really special to me, Nix said. The song also appeared on Nix's compilation Crystal Visions, the very best of Stevie Nix. She wrote in the liner notes that the song was intended as a gift for her mother, who later referred to it as her rainy day song. Buckingham would later call the recording experience the most intense year of my life. When the group decamped in a studio in a CD section of Hollywood Boulevard, they discovered their nine weeks of recordings from Sausalito had been damaged by a machine they playfully nicknamed Jaws. With panic setting in, they cancelled a sold-out tour. And the costly move was worth the sacrifice. Not only did the begrudging do over spur completion of the chain, the band was forced to reconsider and rework many of their songs through a painstaking process of redubbing and splicing old recordings with new ones. It also forced them to finally step back and survey the not yet unnamed album in its entirety. As they listened to the songs come together, John told Rolling Stone he couldn't help but be overcome, he said in 1977. I'm sitting there in the studio and I get a little lump in my throat, especially when you turn around and the writer's sitting right there. Appropriately, John was the one who came up with the album's now iconic name, Rumours, inserting a little lightness into the emotionally heaviness of the experience. I think one day, John and I will write a book on what's gone down, Fleetwood joked with the Los Angeles Times in 1976, shortly before the album's release. The only problem is that no one will believe us. Rumours finally debuted in February 1977 and was an instant success, selling over 10 million copies worldwide within just a month of its release. The band heads out for a world tour. The feuds continue on the road with the band and so did the partying. Nix and Buckingham even argued on stage, which created ripples off stage. I think Buckingham's the only person I ever, ever slapped, Christine told Rolling Stone in 1997. I actually might have chucked a glass of wine too. While both the band's couples are broken up, Mick Fleetwood himself is also trying to heal from a broken heart. As he had found out before relocating to LA that his wife, Jenny Boyd, sister of George Harrison's wife, Patty Boyd, had cheated on him with a former bandmate. Mick was devastated by the news, fired the bandmate and the couple finalised their divorce in 1976 while recording the album. After the loneliness got the better of both of them, they remarried in 1977. However, in 1977, during the Rumours tour, Nick's and Fleetwood begin an affair while in Australia a Rolling Stone cover, shoot the year prior which featured the band all in bed together, planted the seed, according to Nix. She and Fleetwood cuddle in bed in Annie Leibovitz's famous photograph. Fleetwood comes clean with Boyd as she describes in her autobiography, Jennifer Juniper, I've been having an affair with Stevie for the last few months, he shared, since we were in Australia. At first I didn't understand what he'd said, Jenny recalls. It took some seconds for it to sink in. I stared at him in silence, feeling as though I'd been kicked in the stomach my mind and heart in complete turmoil as I struggled to make sense of his words. Mick then told her, The trouble is, I can't make up my mind if I want to be with you or her. Fleetwood and Boyd divorce again in 1978. Stevie recounts the events. Never in a million years could you have told me that would happen, she told Uncut magazine. Everybody was angry because Mick was married to a wonderful girl and had two wonderful children. I was horrified. I loved these people. I loved his family. 
so it couldn't possibly work out, and it didn't. I just couldn't. The last leg of the tour ends, yet they clearly didn't resolve all their issues. They continue to squabble after the tour ends. A huge fight ensues between Lindsay and Stevie at Christine's house in the late 80s when discussing touring. As Nix recalled to Lauda, he threw me against a car and I screamed horrible obscenities at him. I thought he was going to kill me, and I think he thought he was probably going to kill me too. And I said, if the rest of the people in the band don't get you, my family will. My dad and my brother will kill you. Snix later on checks herself into rehab in 1986. To deal with her cocaine habit, Fleetwood Mac has gone through many breakups and reconciliations through the years since rumours. Just when you think they have put the disagreements to bed, some new drama pops up. They reflect on the magic of rumours, their relationships and how they created a masterpiece in the midst of turmoil. Nix told The Guardian that had Fleetwood Mac, and the drugs and fame that came with it, not entered their lives. She thinks she and Buckingham would have gotten married and had children, because we were headed that way, noting that we didn't really mess up till we moved to Los Angeles, and that was when the whole world just ripped us apart. But she believes Fleetwood Mac was our destiny. Christine spoke of her and John's breakup, the reality of the road, and John's more Hyde than Jekyll personality while drinking eroded their union over time. Christine told Rolling Stone in 1977 that the strain of me being in the same band as John started to take its toll. When you're in the same band as somebody, you're seeing them 24 hours a day and you start to see an awful lot of the bad side. Mick Fleetwood recounts his excesses in his memoir of that time, I'm damn lucky I never killed anyone. Nix echoed that sentiment in Fleetwood Mac on Fleetwood Mac, interviews and encounters. If you took out all the bad stuff in the band, the songs wouldn't have happened. There simply wouldn't have been a rumours if everything had been fabulous. Rumours has sold over 40 million copies worldwide, making it the fifth best-selling album of the 1970s and the ninth best-selling album of all time.